Thank you, Jens. Thank you for those kind words. It's a great pleasure to be here with you guys this morning. And uh, as Jens shares a passion for the cranial cervical junction, so do I. And our lab has looked at this area for at least the last 15 to 20 years, uh, trying to elucidate better the anatomy of the ligamentous uh, structures here and some of their function. And hopefully at the end of the talk, which is brief, you'll uh, have a little better understanding of not only the complexity of the ligaments here, but how the textbooks that we use, uh, even at high levels, uh, are incorrect and do not show uh, all of the ligament structures that exist in this area. So I'll give you a couple of slides and hone in on some of the more important uh, ligaments of the region. So this anterior view is uh, showing you the base of the occiput and then the upper four cervical vertebrae. And you'll see that the anterior longitudinal ligament is ascending uh, in the front and then will flare out a little bit as it attaches on the undersurface of the clivus. And we see that it will blend laterally with the capsular ligaments that attach C1 to the uh, occiput. Posteriorly, we see the ligamentum flavum and its uh, cranial specialization, which is the posterior lano occipital membrane. And you see the left vertebral artery here piercing that membrane. We've used that membrane, most of us take it off during suboccipital craniectomy. We've used it for duraplasty with some success and have uh, published that experience. So um, you can get away with harvesting this membrane, using it for something, and there's no functional uh, result in the patients. A little deeper dissection from the back, and this uh, left picture is not compatible with life, obviously, so this is a, a gross uh, depiction showing the extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament, which becomes the tectorial membrane over C1 and up into the clivus. And one of the studies I'm going to uh, mention to you describes this ligament in more detail and sheds more light on its uh, anatomy and potential uh, function. If you were to peel off that tectorial membrane uh, inferiorly, you'd get this view, and this is where the money is, as people will say, this is the critical ligamentous complex of the cranial cervical junction, that being uh, the cruciate ligament with its more important transverse band. You see, uh, if we uh, peel down some of that cruciate uh, ligament, no, we don't have that. If we peel that down, you would see more clearly the alar ligaments extending out from the uh, odontoid process up into the occiput. And then uh, just uh, in the same plane uh, in front of the cruciate, you would see the apical ligament, which I'll also mention to you a couple of studies for. All right, so enough for some uh, very rudimentary background. What I'd like to do is just give you our experience of reevaluating these ligaments of the CC junction, uh, looking at them one by one and trying to add a little bit to our understanding of uh, what they are and what they potentially do. Tectorial membrane we looked at in uh, 2007, and specifically uh, some of the highlights of that study, we found that it attaches much more superiorly than what you'll find in any detailed atlas or description uh, of this ligament in the literature. It attaches as far up as uh, the point uh, where your internal auditory uh, meatus would be located, so up here versus this depiction that shows it somewhat lower on the clivus. It tended to fan out a little bit more uh, and if you peeled it back, you'd note, and this has never been described before, that the tectorial membrane is uh, very adherent to the back of the body of the atlas, but has no adherence to the odontoid, which functionally is intuitive, uh, but had not been uh, discussed before. This ligament, uh, as you might guess, just looking at its attachment <clears throat> and being an extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament, has a, it becomes taut at about 15 degrees of flexion and an equal uh, amount uh, in extension. Interestingly, uh, we found in histologically with some immunohistochemistry, we found at the, the cranial attachment of this ligament that there were multiple calcified areas. This ligament really buries itself into the clivus and holds on for dear life uh, at this site of its cranial attachment, but not its more uh, proximal and distal attachment, uh, we would see that there are more um, 
uh, areas of elastic fibers in the tectorial membrane. And probably the most fascinating finding from this study was that you find almost exclusively type 3 collagen fibers in the tectorial membrane. As you all very well know, the uh, ligaments of this area and ligaments in general have type 1 collagen fibers. So this uh, ligament is uh, doing something that uh, makes it uh, need a type 3 collagen fiber, which has a higher um, reticulin count than other um, associated um, ligaments. Now, some people have peeled back the tectorial membrane and have described a deep layer of the tectorial membrane, which um, our study from 2004 here basically debunked that there's not a deep layer of the tectorial membrane. There's a different layer here called the accessory atlanto um, axial ligament. If you look in the literature, some people will describe it as such. Uh, one uh, interesting finding from our study is that this ligament actually doesn't end at the uh, C2 level, it ends on the occiput. So this is a, a misnamed ligament that should be uh, better called the uh, accessory atlanoaxial occipital ligament. And uh, that comes into play when we look at uh, some of its potential function. This is a, a cartoon up at the top that shows the uh, ligament here laterally just behind the transverse ligament and running from the body of C2 up to the occiput. Uh, again, just uh, posterior and sometimes uh, adherent to the back border of this uh, transverse ligament. Uh, interestingly, if you look at the cadaveric dissection from our study below and you look at the difference between that ligament in the drawing that's what you see in all textbooks and uh, our dissections, this uh, accessory ligament is on either side of the odontoid, so it's not as laterally placed as uh, the textbooks and atlases describe it. So. Um, interestingly, that uh, it's been uh, shown incorrectly for over uh, 100 years. Ligament, as you see from the study, was about 30 by 5 uh, millimeters, so not a, a huge ligament. It's lax in extension. Uh, it becomes maximally taut in about 10 degrees of flexion. And again, it's more medial uh, association with uh, the odontoid and specifically with the transverse ligament at that point. You can see it really uh, bolsters that transverse ligament uh, just uh, lateral to the odontoid. Uh, we found it in 100% uh, of specimens. As I mentioned, it extends up to the occiput. It doesn't end on the axis as uh, most people have discussed. Um, I think we covered all of that. Apical ligament. You see this in uh, almost any textbook that uh, showcases the ligaments of this area, and uh, it's usually described as being the one ligament in this area that's uh, not derived from the proatlas or the, the fourth occipital sclerotome. It's derived from the notochord, and uh, some have uh, championed that uh, uh, chordomas can extend up from this apical ligament, and uh, this is a, a, a potential source of those tumor cells. Uh, however, in our study, we found that this ligament was absent in 20% uh, of the specimens. It's not always there. Uh, it extended, when present, from a little coronal groove at the apex of the odontoid and went up just to the point where you have your third occipital condyle or the condylus tertius, if that was present or not. Uh, it's a tiny little thing. It's only about 7 by 5 millimeters uh, length and uh, width. You could make it taut in about 20 degrees of flexion, 30 degrees of extension. It was redundant and neutral. Uh, and if you really torqued on the cadaveric specimens, the thing would evulse. So it has uh, a, a very uh, small degree of uh, functional importance based on this cadaveric study. Lateral lanal occipital ligament, uh, I would be uh, surprised if many people have even heard of this ligament. It's in some of the very antiquated uh, anatomy literature. Uh, but it's uh, present in, uh, at least in our specimens, 100% of the cadavers. Um, it's hard to get to. This may be one reason that it's uh, rarely discussed. It's uh, just posterior to the rectus captus lateralis, which uh, you basically have to take the head off of the spine uh, and then go from the front uh, after removing everything anteriorly, <clears throat> mandible face, et cetera. Uh, interestingly, it's a landmark and uh, would probably be something that would serve surgeons in this area as it separates very clearly the vertebral artery posteriorly from the contents of the jugular foramen anteriorly. You can see from the prior picture it has a little bit of an inclination from lateral to medial and uh, that's about 26 degrees. You can see it's uh, morphometry there, its thickness is fairly uh, little, it's about 2 millimeters. Uh, we see that with flexion, it was uh, lax uh, and ex uh, with extension the same. Uh, 
however, with contralateral lateral flexion of the cranial cervical junction, it became taut at about uh, eight degrees. Just to show you how difficult it is to get to that area, and again, uh, adding some evidence of why folks may have uh, trouble um, putting that into their list of cranial cervical ligaments. Uh, this is the front of the head. This is a coronal section, obviously. And we see at the level of the styloid process and transverse process of C1, we see our um, rectus capitis lateralis. Here's our rectus capitis anterior. And that ligament, if we take down the muscle, is just behind it. So here it is, a little small thing. For reference, we see the capsular ligaments between uh, C1 and uh, occiput, and then the anterior longitudinal ligament. Uh, a fascinating ligament that we uh, dug up from uh, antiquity is the transverse occipital ligament found in some of the really old uh, literature. Um, in 2010, we did a more descriptive study. Uh, this ligament's found in uh, about 78% um, uh, of the specimens. Uh, if you look at the picture here, you'll see um, it has a really unusual position and trying to come up with a potential function for this ligament, you're, you're hard pressed. It runs uh, between the inner aspects of the foramen magnum and it's interposed here between apical ligament in the front and the superior um, band uh, of the cruciate ligament. So it doesn't have uh, uh, much to offer other than the hypothesis that maybe it's a bolster for some of that superior band of the cruciate ligament when it's moving. It gives it some resistance uh, when it pushes anteriorly. Uh, you can see uh, some of the morphometrics here. It's a, it can be a robust ligament, uh, so it's surprising to me that uh, most textbooks, even textbooks dedicated uh, to the cranial cervical junction, they don't even mention this ligament. In a follow-up study, and probably the, the more interesting part, in 2012, uh, we classified this ligament based on a larger cohort into three different types. And uh, if you look at these typings, uh, some type one, for example, had bilateral connections to the alar ligaments uh, laterally where that uh, ligament attaches onto the skull. Um, some had fibers attaching into the apex of the dens. The type twos we saw, again, having those same connections to the alar, uh, but no fibers connecting to the dens. And then the type threes uh, had no connections to either of those ligaments. And these are the of uh, subclassification. So we have the type 1 here shown in the middle, which is the first picture I showed you. We see a, a little attachment to the apex of the dens, uh, and those attachments were stronger than the apical ligament, which is usually described as being the, the main powerhouse the, at that point. Uh, the type 2s here we see, and then the type 3s that had more of a, a vertical elongation of uh, fibers. Uh, this is not the apical ligament. These are distinct fibers uh, that attach just to this transverse occipital ligament when it's present. A ligament that, uh, when I mention uh, to spine surgeons who operate on this area all the time, uh, and they have a puzzled look because it's been mentioned in one other paper that I know of, is the anterior atlantodental ligament. And this uh, very highly specialized little fellow uh, lives here just in front of the odontoid and attaches as a short band to the back uh, side of the anterior arch of uh, C1, seen in the majority of specimens, as we see uh, in this image, and uh, has um, uh, some connection uh, between the anterior atlanto-occipital membrane that I showed you as the first slide was an extension of the anterior longitudinal ligament. He's very small, um, and if we look at him during rotation, of uh, C1 on C2, you see that about 10 degrees, he becomes fully taut. Uh, Barkow's ligament. Has anyone heard of Barkow's ligament before? This uh, is found in uh, some of the um, early 1900s literature. Uh, it's found in the majority of specimens based on our study from 2010. Uh, and if you look at this, which I'll show you in the next slide because it's a bigger image, it runs from condyle to condyle basically on the medial surface of the occipital condyles, just anterior to the attachment of your alar ligaments. Uh, and about 75% uh, of specimens, there was a connection between Barkow's ligament and the uh, anterior atlanto-occipital membrane. You can see the morphometry there. It's, it's not a huge ligament. Uh, and only extension of the atlanto-occipital joint would produce any tension of this uh, structure. Uh, it had a fairly very, it had a very low uh, failure uh, for uh, tension of 28 newtons. This is uh, the image 
that shows uh, our Barkhouse ligament. So it's an anterior view, anterior border of the frame and magnum. And we see the uh, occipital condyles. It runs condyle to condyle and has uh, some uh, um, communication by touching the very anterior part of the apex of the dens. Uh, and we see the anterior arch. It's uh, in uh, one view, almost uh, an accessory anterior arch of C1. Uh, however, the function of this is a little uh, enigmatic. And I'd like to end with uh, a slide that just because we've been studying human anatomy for you know uh, hundreds of year, hundreds of years, and folks uh, approach me all the time and ask why do we still study anatomy? We've known all the anatomy that we ever need to know that or that's present for 200 years, uh, and uh, I respond to them. Well, we just you know identified a brand new ligament of the cranial cervical junction, never yet described, uh, and I'll describe it for you probably the next time I speak to you because uh, it's uh, in the submission phase right now. And this goes to prove that you know anatomy is uh, not an uh, antiquated and uh, dead discipline. You can still find things uh, that are interesting. How these all come together and uh, function for patients is a, another situation. Some of these ligaments, obviously, due to their size and uh, lack of uh, functionality, maybe just remnants of uh, the proatlas that don't serve a, a huge function like our transverse ligament does and uh, need better studies. But as our MRI uh, abilities become uh, crisper and cleaner, some of these ligaments uh, are going to start to be seen uh, on imaging, and clinicians might need to be aware of at least their presence, that if they're not anomalies, they're normally here uh, and should be appreciated as part of our normal anatomy that is usually not depicted in textbooks. Thank you for your uh, time. Mm -hmm.